Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 32 years, we have invited voices of conscience to explore the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. Learn more about the forum online at westminsterforum.org. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter as well. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church, located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis, and moderator of the forum. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's guest speaker, especially on the eve of Pride Weekend, Bishop Gene Robinson. Bishop Robinson is a retired bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of New Hampshire, consecrated as its ninth bishop in 2003. He was the first person in an openly gay relationship to be elected to the episcopate. He has been a longtime advocate for full civil rights and equal protection under the law for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. He has co-authored three AIDS education curricula for youth and adults, supported debt relief for the world's most impoverished nations, and lobbied for socially responsible investment within the church and beyond. Currently, he serves as a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress in Washington, D.C., where he focuses on issues of faith and LGBTQ rights. He's the author of the new book, God Believes in Love, Straight Talk About Gay Marriage. For Bishop Robinson, the debate on same-sex marriage has been deeply personal. He has been married to his husband, Mark, for the last four years of their 25-year relationship. Ladies and gentlemen, during this historic week when the Supreme Court has ruled in favor of full equality for legally married same-sex couples, it's my pleasure and honor to welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Bishop Jean Robinson. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. I am so delighted to be here, and unbeknownst to you, I delayed the Supreme Court decision until just the day before I arrived <laughs> to just create a little excitement about my visit. Uh, and I did a pretty good job, didn't I? Yeah. Uh, This has been a, a, a very strange day for me because I checked into my hotel and it was the hotel where uh, 10 years ago next month, um, I was summoned during the Episcopal Church's general convention of 2003 uh, to be told that in the middle of my consent process to become the Bishop of New Hampshire, uh, sexual misconduct charges had been leveled against me uh, in an effort to derail my, the consent to my election. And so to walk in that lobby, I, I broke out in a cold sweat just uh, remembering that. Um, I knew those charges were not true, but we didn't know if we could uh, prove them untrue in the time that we had. So it was, it was a very anxious time and I had 24 hour security because of all the death threats and I am delighted to be here uh, without bodyguards and uh, just uh, walking along the streets with nobody caring who I was. Um, there was a uh, uh, just prior to getting that uh, summons, I had walked up the street here to the Caribou Cafe where uh, the woman behind the counter, uh, when she saw an Episcopal Church um, General uh, Convention badge, would ask people whether they were going to vote for or against me in that consent process. And if, if they said for, then she gave them their coffee. <laughs> and I had... I had just walked up to introduce myself to her and then got this phone call. So uh, all of those memories just came flooding back. So um, I was just uh, saying to Bishop Caldwell over here, uh, he said, well, how's it going? How are people treating you? I said, much better than the last time. Um, I, I do want to save uh, lots of time uh, for questions and answers. It really is my favorite part. But let me just um, 
let you know sort of where I want to go with this. I want to say a little bit about why I think we're in this particular moment around the struggle for equal civil rights for gay and lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people. Um, what brought us here? I want to say a little bit about why I think religion is still at the very center of this debate. It's the thing that's holding us back. Um, I want to say a little bit about how this, this struggle um, connects to the other struggles that we have had around civil rights, particularly for African Americans and people of color, uh, as well as, uh, as for women and other uh, oppressed minorities. Um, I, and, and in that regard, I just want to uh, say something about uh, the people who used to occupy this land before all of us white people got here. Uh, I was just in Australia, and they do an amazing thing there. They, they remember the tribe that occupied that land before they arrived, and at every public gathering, they pay respect to elders, both past and present, of that tribe. And I want to just remind us, uh, as Americans, we, we just so often forget that uh, we are fairly recent in this land. And, and so I honor the elders, both past and present, of the indigenous peoples uh, who preceded us here. So how, how did we come to this moment, to, to yesterday? in the Supreme Court and these two rulings, which we can talk about later. But how did we get here? Well, we got here because 20 or 30 years ago, most Americans would have told you they didn't know anyone gay. Well, they might have worried about weird Uncle Harold who always comes to Thanksgiving, or you know those two ladies who live down at the end of the street, they keep their yard so nice, we just love them. But they would have meant that they didn't know anyone who proudly um, openly, even casually, uh, let you know that they were gay or lesbian, bisexual, or transgender. And now, today, is there a family left in America that doesn't know some family members, some former classmate, some uh, co-worker uh, to be gay? And now, when this issue comes up, a face comes up with it, or a relationship that you know comes up. And all of a sudden, people are unwilling to believe the terrible things that have traditionally been said about us because they know them not to be true. Uh, Harvey Milk, the, the uh, great uh, leader in, in the 70s, uh, the first openly gay man to be elected to public office um, in San Francisco, said that coming out is the most political thing you can do. Uh, he also went on to say, uh, because when they know us, they'll love us. Well, at least most of us, maybe. Uh, but that's, that's why uh, this has changed. Now everyone knows someone gay. And now we are in this uh, uh, kind of confusion, at least some people are. I mean, let's remember how change happens. You have, a, you have a world view that pretty much interprets the world to you. And then you have an experience for which that world view is insufficient. Uh, to explain or to incorporate into your life. And so you enter into a kind of confusion or chaos. And you come out on the other side, either denying that that experience ever happened or was important, or you come out with a revised worldview. And I would call that a kind of holy chaos, uh, because it is a, a fruitful and fertile uh, place for God to work. And that's what we've seen. Uh, we've seen it in countless living rooms across this country where uh, kids, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years old, go home to mom and dad and say, mom, dad, I'm gay. And then the family has to decide how deep, how broad, how wide is its love for this child? And does it trump all the things that they've always thought? And most often, the answer is yes. Some people would say that's what's happened in the Anglican Communion. The gay son, the Bishop of New Hampshire, came home to Dad, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and said, Dad, I'm gay. And now the family, the Anglican Communion worldwide, is 
in this holy chaos of trying to decide how deep, how broad, how wide is God's love. But one thing is for sure about all of this coming out. This toothpaste ain't going to go back in the tube. <laughs> So, so why does religion play such an important part? I mean, you know as well as I do that uh, uh, people can prove and argue anything from the Bible. Uh, that's, just, that's just a fact, and there's no changing it. Uh, in fact, sometimes people use the same verses to prove exactly opposite points. But, but with this issue, the, the scriptures, uh, the Hebrew scriptures of the, uh, what we call the Old Testament, the, the Christian scriptures of the New, seem to be pretty clear about this. I mean, what's not to understand about a man shall not lie with a man as with a woman? Seems pretty clear. Well, it depends upon the context. No, the Bible isn't simple, and it isn't just plainly read, and, and so we have to consider context. Let me tell you a story about context that I, that, that I think uh, captures this. It comes from uh, uh, Dan Helmeniak, and it's, it's brilliant because it's, it's so immediately understandable. He says, um, uh, let's, let's think that it's the year 3000. And by the year 3000, the game of baseball has just simply been lost. No one knows the rules. No one plays it anymore. It, it's just lost to the culture. And in the year 3000, you pick up a novel that was written in the year 2000. And one of the characters is described as being out in left field. <laughs> now, in the year 3000, you assume you know what that means because you know what left is and you know what a field is. But unless you know the game of baseball, you don't, you don't know that most people bat right-handed, the, the left fielder backs up to be able to catch the fly balls, and that it's become a metaphor for uh, being out of the loop, out of touch, isolated, and so on. So in the year 3000, you would assume you knew exactly uh, what the author was talking about, but unless you know the context of baseball, you miss the meaning completely. When we're looking at scripture, we're looking at writings that are between two and 3,000 years old. And we have to ask, what did those words mean to the author who wrote them, and what did it mean to the community to whom they were written? And what was the wider context that might have been uh, a part of that? Um, uh, you know, most of the biblical scholarship of the last 50 years has been, in effect, about the game of baseball. That is to say, it's been about the culture in which those scriptures were written and, and the cultures which surrounded it. The, um, the uh, ancient Israelites were surrounded by hostile cultures, idol-worshiping cultures, and much of what we read there is directed uh, in response to them. So... Um, let me just give you a little advice about uh, talking scripture with your, uh, particularly your more conservative fundamentalist friends. I'm assuming that you have some. I hope you do. I hope you keep talking to them. <laughs> but before you start arguing any particular verse of scripture, you'd better have a discussion about how to regard that book, which of course, as Peter Gomes used to say, is not a book. It's a library of books written by a, a wide, diverse uh, variety of people in very different contexts. And if, if you're talking with someone who thinks that God dictated every word in Scripture, then uh, you're going to be arguing from a different planet. And, and, and you may as well not get to Leviticus. But there are a couple of things that, that I will say just in general about context, and then I will tell you what I think is the most important scripture passage for the issue that faces us around gay and lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people. Uh, first of all, I'm going to say something that, that is going to sound very strange. Homosexuality was unknown in the ancient world. Same-sex behavior was known in the ancient world. 
But the concept of sexual orientation is very new. The, the notion that a certain small minority of us would be born affectionately oriented towards people of the same gender, that notion is only about 140 years old. It was in the latter part of the 19th century that someone first posited the theory that a certain minority of us would be born that way. That was unknown in the ancient world. In the time that the scriptures were written, everyone, everyone was assumed to be heterosexual. And so to act in a same-sex manner, which clearly some people did, was acting against their nature. You can't take a modern concept like sexual orientation or homosexuality and plug it back into an ancient culture in which it was completely unknown without doing violence to the text. This is made even more complicated by some of the newer translations of scripture, particularly those that are used by, by the way, most, most conservatives love the King James Bible. And what's really funny about that is King James was gayer than a goose. <laughs> I hope that doesn't mean that sales of the King James Bible are going to plummet. Uh, <laughs> but some of the newer translations take some of the words from St. Paul, for instance, words that we don't completely understand the meaning of. One of them seems to be completely made up by Paul. We can't find it anywhere else in scripture, anywhere else in contemporaneous writings. And those modern translations just solve that little translation problem by plugging in the word homosexual. So you pick up your Bible, you open it up, and it's pretty clear that homosexuals are condemned. And yet, no such category even existed. So you can't plug that back into an ancient text as if we're talking about the same thing any more than you could expect Moses to know that the earth was round rather than flat. The second piece of context is particularly around Leviticus, which is kind of always thrown in our face, is that the science and the understanding of conception is so completely different. In those times, women were thought to contribute nothing to conception. Women only provided a place for incubation, that male sperm contained everything necessary for life. And therefore, to, as the Bible says, spill one's seed on the ground, was to, in effect, be killing babies. And this at a time when the Israelites needed to grow their population to withstand all the threats that were around them. So to spill one's seed on the ground rather than making babies was not only a crime against God, it was a crime against the nation. And so we get all these proscriptions against masturbation, against a man lying with a man as with a woman, and my all-time favorite, the so-called sin of Onan, where a man is having intercourse with his wife but withdraws before ejaculating, spills his seed on the ground, and God strikes him dead. Now there's some birth control for you. So one ha we have to ask, has the context changed? Yes, the context has changed. We understand a lot more. And we seem to have largely given up our, our problem with uh, masturbation and with uh, birth control by whatever means, and, and yet we hold on to a man shall not lie with a man as with a woman, as if it were meant to be eternally true. What's interesting to me is that the people who are the quickest to quote that are not so quick to quote the next line which says they should be put to death. I would actually respect people a lot more if they were going to be literal with the Bible, if they would be literal with all of the Bible. I, I, I've never heard Jerry Falwell or, or um, uh, any of the, of the um, televangelists quote Luke when Luke uh, quotes Jesus saying, if you want to be a follower of mine, you must give up all your possessions. <laughs> There's a literal reading that I would like to see them take on. <laughs> so let me, tell you, let me tell you what I think the most important scripture verse that relates to this. 
It comes from John's Gospel, which, as most of you know, uh, is set at the Last Supper. It's the conversation Jesus has on the night before he died for us. And he says this remarkable thing to, to his uh, disciples. He says, uh, there is much that I would teach you, but you cannot bear it right now. So I will send the Holy Spirit who will lead you into all truth. Now, I take him to be saying, look, for a bunch of rough, uneducated fishermen, you haven't done too badly. In fact, I'm kind of proud of you. But don't think for a minute that God is done with you or with the people who follow you. Because there is so much that God would teach you, but you, you just can't bear it right now, not all of it. And so I will send the Holy Spirit who will lead you into all truth. Look how many centuries we use scripture to justify slavery. Let's remember there were people of faith on both sides of the slavery issue. Uh, and not just in the South, the, the Episcopal Bishop of Vermont, a year after the Emancipation Proclamation, wrote an entire book arguing the case for slavery based on Scripture. And look how many of us, many denominations, uh, many world religions, still discriminate against women based on holy texts. There are people sitting here right now who can remember, at least if you're Episcopalian or Catholic or, or, or something, that uh, wearing, women wearing something on their head, either wearing a hat or a little doily or, or whatever on your head. Why? Because Paul said a, a woman's place in church was with her head covered and her mouth shut. Could it be the Holy Spirit leading us into truth about people of color? and about women, about disabled people. Do you remember when we, when we started building handicapped accessible ramps and people objected saying, well, we don't have any uh, handicapped people here. <laughs> well, duh, of course we don't. They can't get in here. <laughs> and we built the ramps and they've come. We let a couple in right, right back here tonight. So, the question before the church, before the synagogue, before the mosque, before people of faith, is could it be, could it be that the Holy Spirit is leading us into a deeper truth about gay and lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people? It won't come as a surprise to you that I think the answer to that is yes. But we're still having that discussion, and we need to keep having it because it's a holy discussion. How does this connect to, to some of the other isms that we face in the culture? Let's remember what an ism is. It's prejudice plus power. Now, anybody can be prejudiced against anybody else for any reason. But if you've got the power to set things up, the laws, the culture, the norms of the society, in a way that, that empowers that, your particular prejudice, then you've got an ism. So if it's better to be white than to be a person of color, then you set the system up so that it benefits white people at the expense of people of color, and you get racism. If it's better to be male than to be female, you set things up. Um, what is it? Women still make two-thirds of what men do uh, make, uh, in the same job, right? If you can set things up to benefit males over females, you have sexism. And, and the word we should be talking about these days is not homophobia, but heterosexism. If it's better to be straight than to be gay, and you set the culture up, the laws, the norms, to benefit straight people at the expense of gay people, then you have heterosexism. A lot of heterosexuals hate that because it actually names where the problem is, <laughs> right? And, and the culture does this in large and small ways. We've just seen the undoing of some of that in the Supreme Court yesterday. 
right? Um, it's around taxes, it's around inheritance, it's around adoption. It's even around divorce. Most people don't understand that one of the benefits of gay marriage is gay divorce. You may not have thought about this, but two men or two women living together who break up have no one to make them behave well toward one another. Now, I, I, I know divorces can be uh, awful and messy and so on, but, but at least the intention of the divorce laws is to, is to get us to love our neighbor as ourself, even, even when our neighbor is our spouse, and to treat each other fairly and to take appropriate care of the children. Gay couples, lesbian couples, have not had the benefit of anyone making us behave as if we loved one another as we loved ourselves. So much of that was undone yesterday, but, but so much of it has existed, it, it, it's hard to even imagine it going away. Let me tell you one of my, my little teeny uh, uh, examples of how the culture, the heterosexist culture, reminds me and my husband every day, until yesterday, that, that we are second class. We're off on vacation overseas, we're flying home, uh, the plane is approaching the United States uh, border and the flight attendant comes down the aisle uh, with the customs and immigration forms and what does he or she say? One per family. To us, she says, oh, you'll, you'll each have to fill out one of these. And across the aisle is the uh, just newly married couple coming home from their honeymoon. We've been together 25 years. They've been, they've been married a week. And one form will do nicely for them. Because you see, they're a real family. And you're only a pretend family. That's part of what got undone yesterday. It's, it's a part of the heterosexist structure that reminds us that we are second class citizens. Let me end by just uh, because I want to leave time for questions. Let me in just to, to talk about marriage just for a second. One, one of the great things I think uh, that is going to happen, is happening, because of this debate, is that straight people will talk about marriage for a change. So much of it is sort of set up for us that, that you can kind of go through it mindless. A um, uh, 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 rector of a, of a big church on Park Avenue in New York, who's a seminary classmate of mine, and I were talking. I had called him to uh, get permission to officiate as, at a uh, same-sex wedding. And he was saying, you know, straight couples make me crazy. Uh, they come in here to make arrangements for the wedding, and I mentioned that we have six premarital counseling sessions. And they start rolling their eyes, and they're like, oh, you know, we... I don't see how we can possibly fit that in. We've got the, the caterer and the florist and the photographer and the, there's so much to arrange. And six, really six sessions? And he said the gay couples and the lesbian couples who come in here, they want six and more if necessary. <laughs> they want to see every word of the liturgy because they want it to have integrity for them. They want to understand and believe every word that's said. And we ended that conversation by, by saying, it may be gay marriage that saves marriage rather than undermining it. <laughs> the, reason, the reason the church believes in marriage is that it, it is this remarkable experiment that two people decide to make to see if they can learn to love another person as much as, or on a good day, even more than they love themselves. And in doing that, the church believes that we have a tiny window into the selfless love that God has for us. That's why we call it a sacrament. It's, it's one of those places that God promises to show up if invited. And, you know, my mom died about a year and a half ago, and to watch my father, my 
well, he's 88 now, he was not much less then, for the last three years of her life, do nothing but devote himself to her. When she had long ago ceased to be able to contribute anything to their relationship, to see his devotion to her has just inspired me so much. And it's been my little window into how God must feel towards me when I'm just not contributing one damn bit. And God loves me anyway. So marriage is this, is this petri dish in which we conduct this little experiment about whether we can learn to love another person that much. In the first letter of John, it says that those who love know God. That, that where love is, there is God also. It's an amazing thing to participate in the divine. And, and though no marriage is perfect, and, and, and some fall far short of the goals and, and aspirations that we have for it, it is still it is still the effort on our part as human beings to attempt to love in the way God loves, and by so doing, to learn uh, about God's love. The rulings of the Supreme Court make that more possible for gay and lesbian couples. And, and I want to say to you that it, it still astounds me. I've been doing this work for 30 years, it still astounded me that when I, when I read the decision, when I, when I got the news, the, the feeling of affirmation and support that the society I am a part of could, could acknowledge the love that Mark and I have had for 25 years, the love that uh, we have and that is exchanged with our two children and our two grandchildren, to have the society say yes to that, to say yes to us, even after all the work that I've done on this, it just moved me to tears. If you've always had that, it's hard for you to understand what it's, not, what it's like not to have it and then to be given it. It is a moment of unspeakable grace and I am so proud uh, to live in a country um, that, is, that it is attempting to make that kind of affirmation to us. So unabashedly, I believe in marriage. For those willing to make the commitments uh, of marriage and take on the responsibilities of marriage, I believe in marriage for all. And I hope you do too. And I can't wait to take your questions. Thanks very much. Thank you, Bishop Gene Robinson. You're listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. Learn more about the forum online at westminsterforum.org. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter as well. I'm Tim Hart Anderson, Senior Minister of Westminster Presbyterian Church and moderator of the forum. Our speaker tonight is Bishop Gene Robinson, retired Bishop of the Diocese of New Hampshire, and author of the new book, God Believes in Love, Straight Talk About Gay Marriage. While the ushers collect questions from our in-house audience, I'd like to invite the radio audience to join us at Westminster for our next town hall forum on Thursday, September 26th at noon, when political strategist Mark McKinnon, co-founder of the Washington-based organization No Labels, will be our speaker. And now, Gene Robinson, if you would like to return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from our audience. A comment about uh, the Supreme Court decision. It's not everything that we hope for. 
what's next? What are the next obstacles that need to be overcome? Let me just say a, a couple of things about the decision that we did get, uh, which uh, were surprising. Uh, one is that it, it seemed that Justice Kennedy was going to rule against DOMA based on a, a so-called federalist argument, that it was a, a case of the federal government messing in what has uh, always been a state's business. Uh, to have the, the five justices rule based on the equal protection offered in the Fifth Amendment uh, is, is absolutely uh, terrific. Um, the, um, and the Prop 8 case out of California, uh, as you know, it was dismissed because of lack of standing. Uh, and and th this is way more important than it probably sounds, uh, at least to me. Uh, it, it said that the people who brought the case failed to demonstrate or show evidence that they had been harmed by gay marriage. This has been one of the arguments of the other side for a very long time, that, that marriage would be damaged if we let gay people in. And yet no one could demonstrate or offer evidence that they or their marriage had been harmed by um, gay marriage for as long as it lasted in California before the referendum. And, and I think that's pretty significant. Uh, it, it should take that argument completely off the table. Uh, so I, I think that's a, a bit of a silver lining in, in, this, um, in this case. Uh, what's still on the table? 90% uh, of Americans, 90%, that means 90% of you, think that you can't get fired from your job for being gay. And in, in a substantial majority of states, there can be a rumor about you or you can be seen in the gay pride parade and fired the next day and you have no legal recourse. What else needs to be done? Transgender people are going to present the, the, the next big challenge. And as, and as difficult as it has been to achieve acceptance for gay and lesbian people, this will be even, even more difficult. Uh, partly because it is so dangerous to be a transgender person. The murder rate for transgender people is horrific. Horrific. And until we can make it safe enough, for enough transgender people to tell their stories and come out to us the way gay and lesbian people have come out, uh, it will be hard to convince people uh, and even uh, educate them uh, about what it means to be transgender. Um, and let's remember, after we got the Jim Crow laws off the books for African Americans in the 60s, it did not mean racism went away, in case you haven't noticed. There will still be hearts and minds to change about racism and sexism and heterosexism. So the work will continue uh, long uh, uh, past when any of us are living. Uh, so there will be plenty of work to do and there is a job for you in it. Even if it's your finally talking to your Aunt Tilly with whom you can't have this conversation, you need to take her to Starbucks and buy her a strong latte and have that conversation and let her know that all the things that she was taught might not be as true as she thinks. Do you view these decisions, or will we look back on these decisions yesterday as the 21st century's Brown versus Board of Education? Are they that groundbreaking? Yes, I think so. Um, I, I mean, it will not be very long um, until I think we look back at this whole thing and wonder, what were we thinking, right? I mean, when you think about slavery, I mean, can, really, can you get your head around, I can't, putting other human beings in chains and selling them like cattle? I, I think there will come a time when, when we will look back on the way we have treated LGBT people and, and wonder, what in the world were we thinking? Uh, so I, I think this, this will prove to be a watershed moment. And, and if for, for no other reason, it just solidifies, I think, in the, in the public's mind that this is a movement forward that 
uh, is every day taking on the looks of inevitability, right? Uh, most Americans, a majority of Americans believe it is inevitable. Even conservatives believe it's inevitable, right? And that, uh, I mean, if you get them off in a corner somewhere and, and talk quietly, they will tell you they think this is over and that we're only arguing over timing. But let me remind you that the timing is important because we've got 15-year-old kids jumping off bridges and hanging themselves on playground swing sets because of the messages they're still getting about who God created them to be and how despicable and abhorrent they are in God's eyes. Religious people have done that, and it's going to take religious people to undo it. And, do, and do, doing, doing nothing, just sort of like being tolerant, doesn't cut it. Uh, I'd like to say a word against tolerance. I mean, it beats intolerance, I guess, but not by much. If you have ever been on the receiving end of tolerance, you know, someone begrudgingly willing to, I guess, maybe let you exist, it just doesn't feel all that warm and fuzzy. <laughs> We're, and so, so just sort of being at a, a nice place yourself about this is, is not enough. Um, uh, Harvey Milk used to say, I'm here to recruit you, not to homosexuality, but as advocates. And you've got a role to play with somebody you know. You can change somebody's heart and mind about this. How hard, how hard is it for you to get up each day and feel love and goodwill toward fellow Christians who reject you in the name of Jesus? Actually, not all that hard. <laughs> so here's, uh, so let me tell you the, the thing that I have most learned in the last 10 years. I have learned that how someone treats me, no matter how badly they treat me, it does not relieve me of my responsibility to treat them like the child of God they are. And, and I mean, you know, uh, uh, 10 years ago, the, uh, I think it was the Archbishop of, of Nigeria said that gay people were lower than the dogs. And the Archbishop of Kenya said that uh, when I was consecrated, Satan entered the church. Well, you know what? Those two guys and I are going to be in heaven together. I mean, they're going to be a, a little more surprised to see me than I am to see them. <laughs> but, but we're going to be there and we're going to get along because God won't have it any other way. And if one of us was right and one of us was wrong, we'll learn that and it, it won't matter anyway because we'll be in God's presence. And... And my job is to treat them like the people I'm going to be in heaven with. And how they treat me is irrelevant. I mentioned to my teenage daughter that Bishop Jean Robinson was coming to speak tonight at the forum. And I was excited. And she said, who's Bishop Jean Robinson? Is this a non-issue for young people? And yeah, is that a good it thing? is. I mean, uh, it's, it's hard to find anybody under 30 that even understands why we're having this argument, right? And, uh, but it, you know, wouldn't it be nice, those of us who are over 30, wouldn't it be nice to get this sort of taken care of without us all having to die off first? Uh, I mean, I, I, I would be proud of that, wouldn't you? Um, yeah, I, and, and it's for the same reasons that, that the culture is changing, is that they have gay and lesbian friends. And they know this, this stuff not to be true. But here's the thing for, if you're a church person, you ought to be concerned about. You know, back in the, in the 60s, people stopped joining country clubs that barred blacks and Jews. They didn't want to be associated with them, anyone who, who uh, felt that way. And you know what? There are a lot of people under 30 who don't want to come to your church if it's discriminating and, and, and continuing to spew forth hatred, uh, albeit couched in, in a nice biblical language, uh, toward their gay and lesbian friends. 
So unless we want to go the way of, of those kinds of country clubs, uh, we best pay attention to the Holy Spirit's leading uh, because uh, young people have no patience for it. You maybe just answered this question. And uh, what do you mean she didn't know who I was? <laughs> Can we talk about that? But what upset me was that she didn't know what the town hall forum was. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I know, I feel for you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Few social and cultural issues have changed more rapidly in terms of the public perception of where things are going, what's right and what's good, as they have on this particular issue. Uh, certainly in Minnesota that was the case. We were fighting a, a constitutional amendment just a little over a year ago, and now it's legal. So go figure. Uh, to what do you, uh, oh, uh, what, what causes that change so rapidly? Maybe you were just talking about with the I, Holy Spirit. I'm honestly, this is, this is something I cannot figure out. I'm, I mean, I'm grateful for it. It feels like uh, a, a graceful moment. But I, I, don't, I don't know of anything to point to um, other than the, the, the fact that uh, almost every family uh, has been affected by this. Um, I, I, I think because we are sort of equally spread around the culture, you know, they're just as... There are just as many gay kids born to Mormons and to Baptists as there are uh, to Episcopalians or, or uh, atheists. And, and, and because it has so, sort of infused the entire culture in that way, um, uh, perhaps it is, is gone faster. I, I, I honestly don't know. Uh, what, I, what I do know, though, is, is that, and what I say to the uh, LGBT community is, we have simply got to uh, pay attention to our brothers and sisters who are also oppressed and, and, and not be just so focused on ourselves. Let's remember that on the day before yesterday, the day before yesterday, before the, the, the Supreme Court rulings, we got a, a Voter Rights Act um, uh, ruling that is horrible, simply Horrible. I mean, I, I think we ought to be calling for UN observers for our elections. And, 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 and sometimes LGBT people wonder why, why people of color or uh, other oppressed groups uh, don't show up for our stuff. Well, it's because we don't show up for theirs. And we have got to connect these isms and understand that oppression, no matter where it's at work, works in the same ways. And one of the ways the oppressor oppresses is to get the oppressed to fight with each other. Because if we ever actually worked together, we would be the majority. And so I, I think uh, we should give thanks that, that our movement has progressed as fast as it has, and we should take note that, that the struggle for civil rights for African Americans and Hispanics and, and uh, all people of color uh, uh, has suffered some serious setbacks. And, and we need to be, uh, take to the airwaves and take to the streets uh, to work with our brothers and sisters. There were a number of questions about that specific issue. One was, if you were not being asked so much to speak on gay issues, which you do eloquently, what other topics would you like to speak about? You just mentioned one. Are there other topics? Yeah, I, um, well, so uh, in my work at the Center for American Progress, I'm a senior fellow there. This is the think tank that John Podesta founded in 2003. He was um, Bill Clinton's chief of staff and ran uh, President Obama's transition team. I'm really fascinated with uh, the role of religion in public life. I think we've seen the religious right do it wrong. Uh, the question is, uh, what, what is the correct way, what is the helpful way, what's the appropriate way to, to live out the rightful separation of church and state and still have religion be a voice uh, in those public spaces? I, I think the key to it is I statements. I, um, I can say what is true for me in my faith that makes me passionate about 
equal rights for people of color or for women or for LGBT people. I can, I can be motivated by my faith to care about um, poverty programs or to argue uh, that we should not be uh, clearing up our budget problems on the backs of the most vulnerable. It comes from my faith and that propels me into the public sphere. If I want to speak about what, what the, the witness of scripture is to those things, I can precede those statements by saying, for me, or in my experience, or as a person of faith, I believe. Where you get into trouble is when I start telling you what you got to believe. And then, then that's the first step towards theocracy, right? So I'm trying to figure out how to do religion in the public sphere and to do it well. Um, so I love talking about that. Um, and um, I, I think that this growing rift between rich and poor, I mean the un, uh, indescribably rich and the uh, growing poor uh, is, is going to tear us apart. And uh, we are very quickly moving to an oligarchy. And, and I think we've got to, uh, we have to do something about that. And we've got to, uh, you know, I just wish that, that, um, that church people could get a spine. You know, the joke in the Episcopal Church is when all the bishops gather around and lay hands on you to make you a bishop, what they're actually doing is removing your spine. I, I, I will say, in, in my own church's defense, and in praise of, of Bishop Bruce Caldwell over here, it was Bruce Caldwell who 10 years ago, uh, next month, stood in the House of Bishops down at the convention center and, and said, in the middle of this debate about whether I should be consecrated or not, that it had not been since the 1960s that he had seen the church risk its life for something. And, and I'm here to tell you that the Episcopal Church risked its life for us. And everybody thought we were going to fall apart. And we haven't. We are not perfect. We are not the best church. We are not the only church. But I, I think in this regard, God is very proud of us. And, and we, we literally risked our lives for gay and lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people. At our convention last uh, last summer, we welcomed transgender people uh, into the offices of deacon, priest, and bishop in the Episcopal Church. That's in 10 years. Okay, I'm being told to wrap it up. Uh, what can I say? I love being in Minneapolis. I love, uh, I was here... Uh, last November, four days before your election and, and your, um, the attempt to, to ensconce discrimination into your constitution, I debated the uh, president of the National Organization for Marriage uh, on Minnesota Public Radio. And, uh, and I was thinking of you and praying for you and was delighted uh, when that effort failed and astounded that you had the guts to go for marriage equality so quickly <laughs> and the guts to make it a reality. Uh, don't forget, don't forget that there are many, many, many people living in places that do not enjoy what you enjoy here. And we need to work in all kinds of ways, small and large, public and private, uh, to make this a reality for gay and lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people across, uh, across this great nation of ours. Um, I'm going to do this until the, the, the day I can't do it anymore. And I hope you will join me, because there is, there is a ministry for you in this. There is someone whose heart you can move, and maybe only you can move. And I encourage you to join us uh, 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 in this. And let me t tell you what the best part of doing justice work is. This is the reward. You get to meet God. God will be there.
in the middle of that justice work, no matter how hard it gets. And uh, you, can't, you can't beat that for pay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bishop Robinson. Thank you.